Okay, so I could have made this TMM response video sooner, but I'm really busy as it is. I have about two dozen deflating atheism videos I should be working on, and I add more to the queue whenever I'm trying to keep up with current events. So a video like this, which is a response to a response to a response, kind of takes low priority. On the other hand, it doesn't really matter when I made this video. I could have made it three weeks ago, or I could make it three years from now. TMM could just respond with a video of six minutes of him farting into a microphone, and his fanboys will still congratulate him for totally punning me. So, in any case, let's do this. Deflating Atheism responded with a video that uses this as its thumbnail. Well, if logic and mathematical proofs were merely ideas, they wouldn't have any objective demonstrative value at all. Why not? Why do mathematical descriptions have to have some mind-independent existence in order to be consistent with observation? Why does it need to be anything more than simply consistent between minds? For the simple fact that an incorrectly derived mathematical theorem is still an incorrectly derived mathematical theorem, no matter if people agree on it. Which is why we have a basis for saying it's incorrectly derived later on. Which is why minority views can eventually be accepted as true. Which is the same as any other truth that exists independently of people's minds. Unless you grant the existence of an objective exoteric logic that exists whether or not a person believes it, you're kicking the legs out from underneath the very possibility of rational debate. How? Rational debate is simply examining how to understand each other's ideas, and whether we can understand them. Perhaps you think rational debate is about obtaining some kind of mind-independent truth. It isn't. I don't see how it even could be. Even if there is such a thing as a mind-independent truth, the only way to be sure we've obtained it would be to step outside of our own minds and check. Since that's impossible, I don't see how obtaining mind-independent truth is possible. Whether mind-independent truth can be obtained is a different question from whether mind-independent truth exists, although obviously I believe both to be the case. Without the objective of obtaining mind-independent truth, however, rational debate is impossible and we're all just flapping our gums here. The very fact that you believe X to be true rather than Y is a truth independent of my own mind, so the very possibility of disagreement is an implicit affirmation of mind-independent truths. How the fuck do ideas exist independent of time or space? Uh, because Euler's identity was true in the Precambrian era, it'll be true in the heat death of the universe, and it's true in Alpha Centauri, and it's true in fucking Shreveport, Louisiana. So what? As Bertrand Russell said, we now find that a great many things we thought were natural laws are really human conventions. You know that even in the remotest depths of stellar space, there are still three feet to a yard. The fact that there are three feet to a yard everywhere in the universe does not mean that the notions of feet and yards are not made-up human conventions. Euler's identity is perfectly analogous to this. Uh, no, because Euler's identity is not simply asserted as some analytic truth claim, rather it is derived from correct axioms through correct deduction. Now, I know of one derivation, and perhaps there are others, but what's interesting about this derivation is that there are parts to it that don't relate to our own experience, like imaginary numbers, and other parts that do relate to our own experience, like trigonometric functions, so you can't take this mathematical truth and simply box it away as either being an analytic truth claim or a description of nature. You're forced to confront the fact that there exist mathematical truths independently of our own minds. Euler's identity is true everywhere in the universe in the same sense that the statement Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father is true everywhere in the universe. I agree with you entirely. Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. That was the big reveal at the end of Return of the Jedi. Uh, I hope I'm not spoiling it for you. Unless logic and mathematics existed independently of time and space, physics would have no ability to model the universe at all. Why? The universe is time and space. Why would a spatio-temporally contingent set of ideas not be able to form working models of a spatio-temporal universe? Actually, how could ideas which are not essentially spatio-temporal even be effective at modeling a spatio-temporal universe? Uh, because mathematics is the language of physics, and our ability to model anything that happens anywhere in the universe depends on both physical laws and mathematical laws being constant. Now, if mathematics were spatio-temporally contingent, as you say, there would be one thing here, and another thing here, and another thing here, and we have no ability to model what happens in the universe based on what we observe here, it would be chaos, and it would even undermine your whole notion of mathematics being some sort of a consensus. Or the ideas of goodness, or truth, or beauty, or love, or whatever. These are all things that exist, but they exist without a temporal duration or a spatial location. How are these not brain activities? And how could brain activities occur without temporal duration? They are entirely not brain activities. Then what are they? They are abstract objects. 
but they're the kinds of things a mind might apprehend. But hey, if you want to go find the spatial location of the idea of an apple, or tell me how long it lasts for, by all means be my guest. It's located in people's brains and it lasts for as long as there are brains that hold it. Okay, so let's run with your notion that ideas are simply physical processes of brains, and we have two people both with the idea of an apple, and as outside observers we could see some electrical activity going on in this person's brain, some electrical activity going on in this person's brain. So uh, what about them is the same? What can we observe? about both of them that is the same without assuming our own conclusion that they both have the idea of an apple and uh, what in any case does this electrical activity have to do with an apple? And I assume you believe in the possibility of artificial intelligence, right? So now we have a computer program that has the idea of an apple. Well doesn't that just explode your whole notion that ideas are simply physical activities of brains? This guy's rattling off the four fundamental forces and arbitrarily redefining them as four kinds of causal interactions? I'm not redefining a fucking thing. That's what they are. The fundamental forces are the fundamental kinds of interaction. All interactions reduce to these four interactions. First off, this is a huge category error since cause is a philosophical category, not a scientific category. Is causation an interaction or is it not? If it is, why would it be a category error to reference the four fundamental interactions? Ah, your reasoning is so bad! Why do atheists always fail so badly at logic? It's like some mental block preventing them from making logically valid arguments. Ugh. Okay, a causation is a kind of interaction. Sure, whatever, let's run with that. It does not necessarily follow, however, that the four fundamental interactions of physics are the only possible kinds of causes there are that does not follow in any case. <sighs> and when we're talking about God, well, I already made this point in the last video. Take it away, me. Secondly, when we're talking about God being the cause of the universe, obviously God is not a force propagating through a field, because God created forces, and God created fields, and is causally prior to both. Then what the fuck does it even mean to say that a God caused the universe? What is causation if it isn't some kind of interaction? <laughs> Ah, the stupid it hurts! The stupid it hurts! Okay, God interacted with the universe, whatever. God continues to interact with the universe. But it's not my view that God is one of the four fundamental interactions of physics. It's not my view that the four fundamental interactions of physics are the only possible kinds of interactions. That's your baby. It's not my baby. That's your fucking incoherent view, okay? It's not mine. Even if we accept your premise that the four fundamental forces are somehow four fundamental causes... Not causes, causal interactions. They mediate causation. Your argument still fails. For at least three of those fundamental forces, there's an associated carrier particle that propagates through space, so it's the carrier particle that's the proximate cause, and the cause is in every case coincident with its effect. Now there's a hypothesized carrier particle for gravity called the graviton, but even if we don't grant the existence of the graviton, it's still the warped space-time field between two particles that's the proximate cause, not the particles themselves. And there's at least a Planck time in between the action of a carrier particle, or a disturbance in space-time in the case of gravity, and the the reaction of anything else. The actions and the reactions are not instantaneous or coincident. Uh, citation please? As far as I'm aware, the Planck time and the Planck length are simply lower bounds on our ability to measure phenomena. But sure, let's say that there's always a Planck time between the action of a carrier particle and a reaction of another particle. Uh, how is there an interaction? I mean, if there's always a gap between cause and effect, how does the cause jump that gap so that they can interact. Also, you said that all these forces propagate at the speed of light. Wrong. The weak nuclear force is mediated by mass particles, so it travels at less than the speed of light. Yes, I was mistaken there, but rather than detracting from my point that they do not propagate instantaneously, this fact actually reinforces it. Uh, no, because the interactions are between carrier particles and particles, as we've already established, and not directly between particles. The carrier particle could move by Pony Express for all I care, the interactions would still be instantaneous. And quantum entanglement is a form of cause and effect that occurs instantaneously across distances, exactly as you said can't happen. Some physicists believe that there's an interaction here, but many do not. That's why entanglement is not listed among the fundamental interactions. So poof goes your entire moronic premise, it died at your own hand, the four fundamental interactions aren't even the only kinds of interactions in physics.
I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, share, and subscribe.